board members and co-founders of the Parking Reform Network. We're a nonprofit with the goal of educating the public about parking policy and assisting those who are interested in parking reform. We want to welcome everybody to today's event, as well as welcome tonight's speaker, Cheryl Korch from the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Cheryl has prepared a nice presentation for us today on her campaign to pass a parking cash out bill, and we'll be introducing her more shortly. A quick show note, this event is being recorded and being put on YouTube. We'll have a brief Q&A after the presentation, so feel free to drop any questions in the chat window so you can get to those, or raise your hand if you'd like to speak yourself. We'll also have a brief breakout session after the event if you'd like more time to chat with Cheryl. Before we begin, we want to learn a little, little bit more about yourself uh, and the audience. So please feel free to share in the comments where in the world you're from. And also, please take this quick poll we have to set the mood for tonight's talk. I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay. Do we have enough poll uh, responses, Tony? Still, they're still coming in. Okay. Okay, we got 15 of 19. So I think we've got what, we, what we're going to get and we can okay. share it. Okay, wow. We have a lot of bicyclists in our audience tonight. About half of you plan to uh, use the bicycle. Um, we have a good amount who plan to be telecommuting from home. You know, that's what we're seeing now. In the next few months, how many days per week do you think you'll be commuting? We have a lot of people who say they won't be commuting, half, and have a mixed bag elsewhere. Um, as far as transportation benefits goes, um, about a third of you don't have any benefits. A third of you have paid parking, third have transits, yeah, but nobody has parking cash out. So we're glad that you're here tonight. All right, so with that, I want to introduce today, today's speaker, Cheryl Court, who is the Policy Director at the Coalition for Smarter Growth, or CSG. Cheryl leads research, policy development, and implementation in the areas of transportation, land use, housing, and equitable development. CS CSG works in the Washington, Washington, D.C. metropolitan region. Cheryl has led major policy successes to build a more inclusive and sustainable city and region, including establishing and strengthening a D.C. inclusionary zoning program winning adoption of urban street design standards for Prince George's County and reforming the district's 1958 zoning regulations. She's won reforms to antiquated parking policies, including for the Washington DC region's transit agency Metro and the District of Columbia's zoning regulations, which were updated in 2016. More recently, she helped win a parking cash out law to bring parity between employee parking and sustainable commutes benefits in DC. Cheryl holds a master's degree in sustainable development and conservation biology from the University of Maryland at College Park and a bachelor's from the University of California at Berkeley. And with that, uh, Cheryl, we welcome you again and the stage is yours. Great, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I, um, I guess I haven't talked to a national audience since maybe like a workshop in Revolution. So um, I am here in Washington, DC, and that's where I've been doing all of my work. And um, I'm really excited to connect with um, uh, our, all of our parking reform um, compatriots from around, not only around the, the country, but apparently around the world. So it's exciting to have some international um, interest in this as well. So um, I'm going to go through the um, explain to you what we did and um, and then um, hope to have enough time to have a good discussion about how um, some of the things that I learned could um, could be applied elsewhere as you 
Facebook to taking on this kind of a campaign. Um, so I'll just uh, forward my document. Oh, okay, hold on. All right, here we go. Okay, so Coalition for Retirement, just for, by introduction, um, we are a regional nonprofit organization in the Washington DC region. Um, we are advocating for walkable, bikeable, inclusive transit oriented communities um, as the most sustainable and equitable way for our DC region to grow and provide opportunities for all. And I've been doing this work for, for many years. Um, just finding the best way to forward my slide. It's a little glitchy. There we go. Okay, so what it, I, I, maybe I just start with the definition about what is parking cash out. Um, parking cash out is um, the employer commute benefit practice of converting the value of a parking space subsidized by the employer to a cash benefit to that eligible employee. In practical, ter practical terms, this means someone who is offered a free parking space at work is able to flex the the, the cost of that parking space toward another commute option and can keep the remaining cash um, or actually just keep the parking space. But it's, uh, it's to try to level the play playing field in terms of incentive of how people are commuting to work. Um, parking cash out is an important policy tool because um, about 80% of employers provide free parking to their workers. And we know that if you're offered um, this commute benefit of free parking, you are very likely to take it. Um, on the, the pie charts here show, uh, this is actually from, uh, this is data that we collected from our, uh, that was in one of the, the data and information that we did for our campaign. It shows, these are actually just DC, residents who are working in DC, it shows when the employer offers free parking to that resident who's working. Um, almost three quarters of them are going to drive alone and 15% of them are, would take transit and 8% would walk a bike. If we don't, if the employer does not provide free parking to that employee, we have a completely different pie chart where almost half are riding public transit um, walk bike rate goes up to 23% and a little less than a quarter are in fact driving alone and then more people are carpooling as well. And this sort of goes to the heart of the argument that, oh, people drive because they need to drive and you can't, changing incentives about um, driving and parking aren't really going to change people's behavior very much. This pie chart sort of, sort of demolishes that argument. Um, and uh, we know from studies that um, parking cash out results in a 10 to 20% decrease in drive alone commute trips and vehicle miles traveled. Sorry about that. There's a, the forward of my slides is a little glitchy. Okay, so why DC was a good laboratory for taking on the parking cash out campaign. Um, you know, first of all, I want to say that this obviously is building on um, there are local parking cash out policies in other parts of the country, most importantly, California. Um, so we were examining what California was doing and how can we um, improve upon that. And so, and we do have some good results out of California, though there are some um, kind of major sort of exceptions that make implementation not nearly as extensive as we would like to see. So in terms of why DC was sort of a good case study, um, DC is a city state, uh, though no votes in Congress. So I just want to say, if you have an opportunity to have a, have two senators and one congressperson or many congresspeople, please uh, tell them that you think that DC should um, have votes in Congress as well, because I would like to have one. But leaving that aside, um, we're a city state, so we don't have the same um, uh, like state enabling issues that um, a, another city might have in terms of um, implementation of this kind of policy. Um, DC has actually the largest walk and bike to work rate in the country now at uh, 18%. So we have a really good constituency. And of course, we have um, most commuters are not driving alone to work. They are walking, biking, or riding transit to work. We have a major transit system, and um, I think about the, uh, 
need to look about the third highest ridership transit ridership in the country, but I should double check on that one. Um, and another really important precondition is that um, in 2014, we passed a, a pre-tax transit benefits law that requires employers to offer to employees the opportunity to use their own <clears throat> earnings, set them aside pre-tax in order to buy their transit pass, basically. And also, DC's long range transportation pl plan does recommend parking cash out as a good um, transportation demand management tool. Um, starting, so talking about kind of how we formulated the campaign, um, you know, I think I'd say one of the big sort of landmarks was sort of this impetus or the kind of precursor to it was the Sustainable DC Omnibus Act of 2013, which is where it requires a pre tax transit benefit. Um, we tried to get parking cash out into that as an amendment, but we were not successful. So we knew we had to sort of give it a go um, as a standalone as a standalone bill. And in fact, ultimately, we amended the provision for pretext transit benefits in this act. That's actually what the legislation was. Um, so we, you know, looked around to um, how are we going to promote parking cash out either voluntarily or legislatively, and we look for natural allies, we look for expert volunteers, we have um, sort of a, a wealth of really talented, um, generous um, experts in the field who were able to, to crunch data for us and really give us a lot of good guidance. Um, our bicyclists, um, a regional bicyclist association, WABA, was a huge part of, um, a part of really important partner. We have a local, uh, a, a uh, pedestrian advocacy group called All Walks DC, and um, important people who were involved with that were really important to to our campaign. DC Sierra Club came in and was a, who was a big supporter. Black Women Bike was is a more of a social group, but also very supportive. And then there are these um, bike and pedestrian advisory councils that were created through legislation, and they um, were a great way to connect to people from each part of the city so that you could always sort of be in contact with someone who might be particularly important for a legislator you might be having a hard time finding good constituents for. So that those, and they were tracking legislation and, and what the, the government was doing. So they were helpful. Um, I put in parentheses workforce development groups because I, I reached out to workforce development groups working with folks who were really reliant on transit to get to work or to, to have reliable transit to get to work. And, um, was not so successful. They were a lot more interested in just making transit more um, affordable and um, and were kind of less sort of, I think that probably a lot of the people they were working with were just trying to get jobs, keep their jobs, get a transit pass basically. And so we supported them in that, but didn't get much uh, engagement from workforce uh, development groups and, and similar groups. Um, we did an online survey with our members and we uncovered some really useful contacts and experience, I think that uncovered, it uncovered the only um, parking cash out programs that we found in the city was through our online survey from people on our database. Um, we reached out to, we identified businesses that had an interest in sustainability. And um, those businesses basically are architecture firms and transportation uh, planners or transportation consultants. And, and a few others. And then we also had a, um, a pretty robust education and research component of this, both um, to make sure that our pre-tax transit benefits was a successful program getting implemented since it was new, and also um, research um, on an education around parking cash out more generally. And I'm really grateful that the Transit Center was able to provide a grant for that. Okay, so I'm going to quickly try to quickly go through the timeline. Um, it's actually a very long timeline, which um, I just say it was uh, it was not easy to pass this legislation, but we ultimately were successful. Um, so I've, I've given a little bit of the background. I'll start in um, say like in uh, we we met with a, a well I'll say December 2014. Um, we met with a new council member who had just been elected. Um, we, he was uh, very exciting, uh, someone who really sort of understood what really was speaking our language. Um, we asked him if he would be willing to sponsor a bill to, um, to create a parking cash out requirement for employers who were providing a, um, a parking benefit to their employees. And I'll say specifically that 
the idea is that if an employee is or employer is providing a parking subsidy, then why can't we just have that subsidy in a mode neutral form so that um, that employees could choose how they wanted to spend the money that the employer has already decided to allocate for a commute benefit. Um, so we secured the the um, the the commitment from um, Ward 6 council member elect at the time, Charles Allen, to do that legislation. Um, we were also starting to ramp up um, outreach and education. And we did an event um, in uh, February. The, um, we had, and that was sort of more of an educational event. Um, DC Department of Transportation was a part of that to talk about their programs and to, um, and also actually Transit Center had just published a terrific book called Subsidizing Congestion on Parking Subsidies. Um, and finally, uh, we were sort of working on getting the bill introduced. It actually took a while to get the bill introduced because we needed to secure the other key sponsor for the, for the bill. And that actually took a while, took some work. And ultimately we were able to, uh, to introduce it in March of 2017. Um, we, uh, we, other things, uh, we did outreach to employers, figure out everywhere we could find, you know, get more involved with things that I didn't know a lot about, like finding um, personnel directors um, at businesses to understand how they look at uh, commuter benefits. And, um, and uh, we're really fortunate to have had a, this grant from Transit Center to work on sort of the research and education around parking cash out to actually do focus groups. And those focus groups were, are um, covered in a, a fair amount of detail in our, um, in our publication. So I'd really recommend that um, folks who are thinking about taking this on, I'll go into a little bit more detail, but like there's a lot more detail in our publication that we, we posted on our website about the focus groups because it's, it's really useful. Um, we, uh, you know, continue to do re uh, uh, outreach, but, um, you know, we, we were put into a transportation committee, which we had expected, but um, it was, um, we, were, we knew we didn't have three uh, bill supporters. We had two bill supporters, the chair of the committee, transportation committee, and Charles Allen, the Ward Sex Council member, we needed a third vote. So we knew this was gonna be tough. Um, we finally got a hearing in late September. Uh, we had a good showing. Um, I had spent a lot of time reaching out to businesses since this was a business regulation. I knew that I really needed to demonstrate that businesses um, could, could support this legislation. So we had 16 witnesses testify in support, three were bet against, five of them were employers and the Department of Transportation testified in support of the bill. And so that was obviously huge. We had pointed out to them that it was in their long range plan. Um, and so anyway, so that was super helpful. Um, we, uh, we really went to work um, doing even really sort of doubling down on reaching out to the um, uh, to the council members who we needed to, to vote on this. And I will say that also during this time, I was learning more about um, per, uh, human resources managers and how they look at benefits and um, had um, a lot of uh, useful um, conversations with them. We were trying to see if we could actually get um, you know, uh, uh, some organizations or, or companies to implement a parking cash out program because there were very few, we found very few. Um, and so we we're trying to just get something going sort of voluntarily, which we never got going voluntarily. Um, and I'll go back to a little bit more about our business outreach after, after I sort of get, go through the timeline. Um, uh, so uh, we, you know, sort of trudged along um, and uh, we actually published our paper before we passed the law. So it, it, the timelines here stops in 2018. I'm gonna to move to the next slide, which um, is basically our addendum. Um, so starting in, kind of coming back to January, 2018, we, um, we, had, uh, we had meetings. The main meetings were with the DC Chamber of Commerce with the hospital and university lobbyists. They didn't like the bill very much. Um, but nothing much happened. Um, the bill actually got reintroduced in 2019. Um, and this time it actually exempted employer owned parking. And this was a thing that was very painful for us. We didn't want to do it, but um, it was really the way we were going to move it forward with the um, uh, one of the bills 
um, key sponsors and certainly was, um, we had hoped was gonna really allay the opposition of hospitals and universities. Um, we still didn't have a lot going on in 2019. Something important happened in 2019 in August, which is um, what the, the, the third, the person that we thought we could get a third vote from, the Ward 4 council member, drew a very viable primary challenger. And that started to change the politics of, um, of, of, this, uh, of this committee composition. Um, so, uh, in October, so you're seeing this is a long time, things not really happening. In October, there was um, this open streets event. So we um, we decided to launch a little petition canvas at the open streets event because it went through Ward 4. And we collected you know, over 200 signatures and almost 100 in Ward 4. We set up very visibly. There's a photo of me and, um, and a transit advocate. Um, we, uh, we wore these sandwich boards that said, um, green your commute, ask council member Todd to support uh, flexible commute benefits. Um, and, uh, and then we got another meeting. We'd had a couple meetings with these council members. We got another meeting with him and he committed to supporting it in December, 2019. We voted on in January to 2020, even though it said that it was, um, it was a unanimous vote. We really struggled with one of the council members who kept on expressing, uh, council member Ward 5 kept on voicing concerns. Um, and at the same time, there was another council member who, had, who we didn't even try to get onto the board with, who was on the committee, Jack Evans, he actually had quit um, due to a, a corruption investigation during this period. So that actually dampened the opposition because the strongest opponent was no longer on the committee and no longer on the council. Um, so we got the votes through in uh, March and April final votes, and though we um, had to keep kind of fighting for it because the Ward 4, 5 council member continued to um, question and kind of throw things in the last minute, we, um, we were able to, to get it through. But as you can see, it took quite a few years. Um, I just want to go through, review a couple of the um, sort of the key points of um, what I think can be applicable on um, the public outreach. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the, the focus group because um, this was so, this is so important when, when you're pitching the idea of parking cash out. Um, we tested things like, should we call it parking cash out or should we call it commuter, flexible community, commuter benefits? Focus group said you should, ca you should call it commuter, flexible commuter benefits. Um, so we do that on our website. Uh, parking cash out is kind of a wonky term we all know what it means because we're really into parking um, reform, but don't don't call it that to the general public. Um, use inclusive language. Talk about choice um, and flexibility. Um, avoid talk about fairness, which might surprise some of you because we can certainly think about why or make an argument for why it's unfair that say a worker who doesn't own a car and rides pays to ride the bus every day to work and is offered a parking space would really like to have the value of that parking space in cash so that she can pay for her bus that way. That seems fair to us. It seems quite unfair that she doesn't get that option. Um, but that is not how people necessarily perceive it. Um, and specifically in terms of the walk and bike commute, I used to talk up the walk and bike commute a lot since it's so many people walk and bike to work. It turns out that giving paying people to walk or bike is perceived as unfair because their their commute is cheap or free, and they're lucky enough to live near their jobs. So those were not winning arguments. Um, so um, what you know what were any winning arguments are giving people flexibility and choice to make decisions that best fit their lives. They might want to drive sometimes, and they might want to uh, ride the bus another time. Um, and also um, the, the sort of the walk bike commute perception is that those are affluent people. Um, it's not uh, true. Uh, the walkers uh, earn less than, um, than uh, drivers do, but it's still sort of this perception that the middle class driver uh, is being unfairly treated um, by a parking cash out um, requirement. Um, we, you know, we got, we got good earned media. Um, we got some not so good earned media. Uh, this, the, the feature, this photo I have of, of from, um, uh, channel four was a terrific 
story just man on the street he's like yeah that makes perfect sense you know i you know i don't have a car or whatever so um the media was it was a little tricky we we got some great media and we also there's a business sponsored think tank that did a total hit piece on us it was very negative we responded in a in a, in a local urbanist blog called great great washington um and uh you know also the the sneaker subsidy was not our messaging i would not use it but that's you know that's what uh the the media was was picking up on um i'm gonna move forward since i kind of run out of time uh I'm trying to advance this there we go okay so business outreach business outreach outreach was critical this is a business regulation so you need to spend a lot of time talking to businesses we got a total of 19 letters of support and we got five to testify it was a huge undertaking to find um businesses who were willing to write a letter saying yeah i'm totally good with a new regulation um it, it um it, we ended up relying mostly but not exclusively on businesses that leaders that we already knew people who were in a position to make a decision like a principal in an architecture firm or a transportation consulting firm to write that um, universities did not turn out to be very friendly, despite the fact that they usually talk a lot about sustainability. Um, I spent a lot of time reaching out to universities and got really uh, no real support from them. Um, I, uh, I, you know, had sort of two tracks. One was to work with human uh, resource managers to both understand how they do community benefits and also look at how we could make it work that they could do a parking cash out. Many were, very, were interested and thought it was interesting and receptive, but um, it's sort of hard to kind of redo an existing system. It's, it's, it's very kind of, it tends to be pretty um, set in their ways. Um, and uh, I, at some point, you know, on the one hand was trying to find employers to embrace this and do it. And um, ultimately I found that what was, all I ultimately needed from a legislative perspective was to get business leaders to write me a letter of support for the legislation. I didn't actually have to care whether or not they were implementing parking cash out because if we passed the law, they would be. And, or, or basically, and here's the other thing, a lot of them didn't have, so I have a, a little bit of outside noise. Um, a lot of these, not very many of these businesses, very few of them provided parking as a benefit for their employees. A lot of them provided, um, obviously they had to provide pre-tax um, and some provided some transit benefit, uh, and one or two provided a bike benefit. Um, and so uh, I kind of abandoned the, the effort at some point of trying to find um, employers who would actually implement a new, new pro, cash out program. Um, so a little bit like how to lobby the bill. It's like collect, find all your best experts, build your alliances with all you, all the folks that you you collaborate and a lot of good progressive stuff with. Um, find a, a legislator who's really going to champion your bill and you know map that strategy through how you're going to get that bill through the committee process. Um, and Go out and you got to spend a lot of time to find businesses to support it. It's going to be really important, especially say in the wards of the, or not. Or just ultimately, volume is really important. I had you know I had to convince a council member who's like, how many business letters do you have? And so it was really important to say that I had 19 business letters to support because we had the Chamber of Commerce on the other hand saying this is terrible and we shouldn't do it. Um, engage your Department of Transportation. They can always be helpful if they're at all sympathetic to this. Um, and uh, look at all the ways that you can argue for this that is already adopted or argued for in local and regional plans. Um, you need to continue to, to demonstrate public support through your media, social media events, action alerts, uh, reaching out to your, your elected officials um, and provide the data, the fact sheet, the responses, the memos. I've written like a million memos responding to every critique of this um, for these council members basically um and you know continuously engage those legislators and their staff so that you understand so that they know that you're there to work with them that you have um that you that you're bringing constituents to them and um and work with your allies to make sure that you're always able to bring those constituents and allies or, or constituents to the, the legislators so they know that those those supporters are there 
and um, and you know mobilize and prepare for that for that hearing. Um, and be persistent in terms of finding opportunities to reach those council members. Um, we had uh, volunteers, you know, I, I was invited by a community leader to go to a community walkthrough because it was an opportunity to talk to the council member that we needed to talk to. At the end of our community walkthrough on a, a, a issue related to pedestrian safety, the guy who was leading the what the community leader was leading the, you know, said, I wanted to talk about this bill and here's Cheryl to talk about this bill. We had a conversation on the street about this bill. Um, be sure to track the political dynamics. As I said, we had um, the person who ended up um, uh, voting for being our third vote had a primary ch ch challenger um, who, who popped up during this process and then the other the other customer resigned. We weren't really courting him, but he's it certainly mitigated um, the the negative sort of influence that he would have. Um, and um, ultimately, when you get down to it, you're going to be deciding on compromises that are going to be ex acceptable or unacceptable because compromises amendments will be made to your bill. Um, try to have the last word of always being in touch with all your legislators and staff and um, be sure to reward your legislators for supporting the bill. Um, this is a photo of a, a wonderful uh, volunteer um, getting uh, collecting names at this open streets event. It was um, just a tremendous opportunity that just popped up and actually was recommended by um, an activist from this part of the city who said, oh, you should definitely canvas at this open streets event, it's a perfect place to do it. And I was like, oh no, it's just, I'm just, you know, this is just never gonna work. And I was like, you know what? She's right, we gotta do it. So we were able to muster the volunteer canvassers and go out and do it. Um, so that, that's, I guess that's the end of my formal presentation. And I just wanted to, to note that um, on the right, flexible commuter benefits, that's our, our full report, which covers the focus group, which is something I think that people should definitely take a look at. And then on the left, um, we did an addendum, which sort of picked up where we left off um, in terms of finalizing, uh, getting getting to the to to the end, to getting the um, the legislation passed. So that is maybe I took a little too long, but um, I would love to um, you know hear what people are thinking about and working on. All right, thank you so much, Cheryl. That was great. Um, thank you also for sharing your story with us and all your work in doing for this effort in DC. And it was really useful. And I hope that a lot of people sort of adopt this campaign playbook and model so that they can follow up in uh, your footsteps. And so with that, we wanna jump right into the Q and A. We're gonna have about 15 minutes for this. Uh, first, I wanna open it up to the floor to see if anybody would like to ask a question. Feel free to raise your hand. Uh, if you like, you can turn on your video and unmute yourself if you have something to say. We can call on you. Okay, I see uh, Tina asks, how is the parking benefit calculated? The benefit is, um, so what happened, we really tried hard to keep the um, owned parking as a part of this benefit and to basically we we spent a lot of time coming up with definitions for how you would be able to assess the market price of that parking space in the end um, we actually do still have some language about um, analyzing the the market price but really the benefit is simply um, calculated based on uh, leased parking so basically an employer goes into the basement of their building and um, gets parking uh, parking le leases parking uh, on a on a monthly basis pretty much um, and uh, and then that you know $150 or $200 benefit is simply converted into cash or a combination of cash and a transit benefit um, and then one of the compromises that we made was um, one of the employers who was supporting, but then kind of didn't like, then became uncomfortable with cash out. Um, we came up with an alternative that you, the employer could put the benefit, flex it from a parking benefit into a health benefit. Um, and we, you know, we see that sort of nexus there that that's, uh, that, that that makes sense. And it's basically, we're trying to get rid of the, the nexus between paying you to drive and paying you to do you know, something else. Is that enough of a, an answer? Okay, thank you, Cheryl. And I see that Tony has a question. 
but to ask questions. Yeah. Me. So I'm I I'm just curious what I, I you touched a bit on some of the you know opposition, but but what is I, I find this to be such a logical policy. I'm curious, like what are the arguments that that people give against implementing parking cash out? Um there is, I mean, this was very, very hard to, I think it's, um, it's upsetting the parking status quo that it's, it's always considered a good to provide more parking, basically. Um, and so I definitely feel that here, here's sort of the, the sort of scenario is that if, um, in fact, we, we finally found a human um, resources manager who was someone who I had actually known for a long time and was, um, at a nonprofit, and so we were able to get more details. Basically, we actually ran these spreadsheets to show an alternative scenario because this nonprofit was paying 100% of the parking costs, and I think it was like these. I can't remember exactly what the parking spaces cost. They were like 160, or I think they were like 160 or 200 dollars a month, right? So a very substantial commute benefit. And um, if you biked or walked or rode transit. Um, I think there might have been a there might have been a transit benefit, but it would never equals what basically what happened the, the way that the uh, commute benefit law is set up is it's supposed to be cover the cost of your commute. And so if your parking space costs at two hundred dollars, then that's what you can um, take as uh, you know as uh, untaxable. Although the laws have changed a little bit, it's a little more complicated than that now. Um, but uh, if you uh, take transit and it and it cost you $50 a month to ride the bus to and from work, then that's what you can take for your benefit. So someone who drives get a, gets a $200 benefit, someone who takes the bus gets a $50 benefit. And then if you walk or bike, there are a few, some employers were doing the $20 until they got rid of it. Um, and then if you walk, you don't get anything. And that's actually, uh, there's a large share of people walking to work. Um, so changing the status quo is difficult. The sense that um, parking is a good, uh, like, so what about the single mother who needs to drive to work and drop off her children at daycare and school? Are you saying you want to take your parking? <laughs> no, we're not. We want to give people the choice so that they can choose what modes make the most sense for them. Um, the challenge is that um, the, the practice is a, a very generous subsidy for parking and a much less generous subsidy for transit or um, not, none for walking and biking. And so if you're going to level the playing field, um, would, you, uh, would you redistribute the subsidy that you're, like basically if, so, if someone is offered a parking space and doesn't take it, doesn't take a $200 parking benefit because they bike to work, well now they could have $200 in cash instead. Well, that makes a lot of sense to that bicyclist um, and so is that now a new expense that the employer hadn't planned on making in the commute because they expected only three quarters of their workers to take the, the parking benefit. So that becomes sort of complicated. It's like, are you trying to take parking benefits or to reduce the parking benefit of someone who has it now? Um, and then uh, arguing for walk, the walk bike benefit is not, like it, you, it depends on, I think it might depend on where you are, but for DC, it was not a fruitful pursuit. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't work for a exclusively bike advocacy organization. So it's, I'm sure it's, it's challenging for, for my allies who do. Um, but basically the walk, walkers and bikers know who they are <laughs> and they were mostly our activists fighting for this but I really highlighted that um, the lowest income commuter is by far the bus rider and they could potentially really benefit from this but all those things it's like you're trying to take away a middle class driving benefit from people who are the main voters of a lot of these you know council members basically. Thank you Cheryl. And then and regulation, it's just an regulation. Look, why don't you, you know, if, if an employer wants to provide a different kind of commute benefit, then they can. Thank you, Cheryl. So next we have a question from Sean. He asks, are there results you know about yet in terms of how many or what percentage of employees utilize the cash outs 
and or if it's led employers to reduce their parking footprints? Yeah, well, so the, the law hasn't gone into effect yet. It's, it's just going, it's just kind of moving forward now. Um, so basically the way the law was structured is that an employer is responsible for offering cash out or offering alternatives to the parking space at the point that they no longer are um, have a sunk cost in a lease as the lease expires basically. And so <clears throat> then at that point, um, the employer isn't left holding the bag with a lease, uh, having a double expense, right? Of leasing a parking space and having an employee say, I'd rather take the cash and ride and bike, uh, ride, ride the bus and bike. Um, so we don't have the results yet on that, um, but you know, from other research, it's looking at like a 10 to even 20% um, switch. Um, and in fact, I think DC um, Federal Highway actually did some parking cash out research on this and showed, I think about a 10% um, switch or it might've been, I'm, the data is sort of like, is it BMT, is it um, trips or is it um, kind of pr proportion of the workforce that makes that change? But like 10 to, you should expect something between 10 and 20% switch over. All right, we have a question from Joyce. She asks, how did you respond to the quote, if they want to offer it, they can, don't impose regulation objection? Um, so, right, and I guess the other thing is that employers <clears throat> or opponents who were employers would say you're imposing a new cost on um, em employers. And we're saying, no, you've already chosen to allocate a commute benefit. We just would like to make it in a form that would be more equitable, something that that workers who might not own a car could use, since you've decided to offer this to your employees. Um, the our argument is that uh, you know I did try to get voluntary um, uh, parking cash out programs, and was basically I found a couple, um, but uh, but. No one was interested really in doing that. Uh, it, it takes more to, to change that. I found a couple of examples, like one employer moved um, offices and when they moved, they bought out the, they had the, the practice of offering a parking space for high paid or senior level staff. And so when they moved, they simply bought those out, cashed those out basically because that had been the terms of that contract. So they cashed out employees who had who had received that perk basically. And when they moved to the new site, they provided no parking benefit whatsoever. And they gave all employees a corporate membership to our capital bike share. And that was it. Um, and so that's much cheaper basically than offering a parking benefit. Um, but that's kind of the most change I found. And the, and the other employer that I had mentioned before, they um, discontinued um, when they got a new CEO, they just considered the practice of providing any uh, commute subsidy, which is really their parking subsidy, which was a big change. Um, so in terms of don't impose a regulation, um, there are a lot of impacts that we can demonstrate, that we've demonstrated through the data that um, the, the a parking, a free parking space um, has a huge impact on um, the commute patterns, the commute choices of workers, which actually has an overall impact on the city, on slowing down buses and people riding the bus because of all the traffic congestion or basically unnecessary traffic congestion, the pollution, the crashes, all the sort of um, public interest sort of like concerns related to this unnecessary incentive to drive that doesn't necessarily meet the needs of employees and has a lot of negative impacts for, for the rest of us, for the city. Thank you, Cheryl. We have a question from Jeffrey. So he asks, not sure how much this applies to DC given the strong housing markets, but did the arguments ever come up of incentivizing residents to live in DC, sort of the opposite as free parking incentivizing sprawl, a parking cash out incentivizes the return to the city? <laughs> um, DC has uh you know, been, become a very in-demand place to live. And uh, we really struggle with housing affordability is, is really our top issue. So um, I'm sort of having a hard time 
I lived here since it was a uh, declining city with hemorrhaging population every year to one that um, is growing rapidly to growing um, and still um, growing at a moderate pace. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how to, how in a weak market, um, I mean, I, I just think that parking cash out makes a lot of sense um, anywhere. Um, it's uh, where where parking is very low value. There won't, and this was another argument we had a lot of, especially for the the employers who are on the outskirts of downtown, not not in downtown, but kind of the outer parts of the city. That um, parking isn't worth very much. So for them to give free parking surface parking around their office building, um, you know, would be uh, the we would say, well, the value would. What is the market price in this context? Probably not very much. It costs money to ride the bus to that location. So it'd be nice if the floor was the same cost as it was to ride the bus, um, but uh, but parking um, in a kind of low demand environment where there's a lot of cheap land basically is going to have a low price associated with it. Okay, so next we have a question from Alan Greenberg. Alan, would you like to ask a question? I just uh, hi hi Cheryl. Um, hey Alan. <laughs> So uh, I, uh, it's not really a question. I, I was uh, uh, involved a lot as a citizen. I also worked for the federal government, but uh, under the previous administration, they were very, didn't love this. So I, um, so all my work and what I did in DC was um, allowable, but kind of low key. So I, I was involved and I just want to commend Cheryl. I mean, it was, I'd forgotten many of the things that were some of those details. I, I um, want to add just a few things listening to the discussion. Um, first off, uh, one thing that's particularly unique about DC, which is different than the California bill, is that uh, the, the market values are very high and the cash out value is based on the market value. And that means that the benefit, uh, and Cheryl was talking about the outskirts where the costs are a little bit lower, but in a relative sense, the costs, uh, the price of parking uh, is quite high. And so the value of the benefit is high and much higher in most cases than what people would pay to get to work in any other way. So there's cash even after you're, say, supporting uh, paying for a transit commute. Um, it was a bit of a game of whack-a-mole in the sense that it, it was a, a combination of um, uh, telling people that whatever they raised as a concern wasn't, and we'd explain it, or we wrote another memo on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we wrote, we wrote a lot of memos. But um, so in terms of uh, certainly the uh, allowance for uh, shifting the money to the employee portion of the health benefit, um, because some employers say, hey, we do all these great things that we'd like to do it another way. And if, if it was real and the employee would recognize that benefit, we were happy with that. Uh, the health benefit um, and some employers said we didn't want to be bothered. And we said, well, you have two options. We, we had a, you just pay a fee option. The he fee was pretty high and you wouldn't really want to do it. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. I think it's a hundred bucks a month per spot. Why, why do that and give it to the government when you can give a benefit to your employee? Um, the other comment we always made was they didn't have to offer parking. That was always an option. Um, and the broader argument that we, well, and then we had a, with institutions, we had a bunch of them saying we're already doing all this TDM planning. Right. So there is a TDM plan out, but it's actually a pretty stringent uh, requirement. The district has a very uh, a tight, tough uh, SOV commute mode share goal. And the TDM plan has to actually uh, approach that goal, get 10% closer every year, or they lose the option of not cashing out. So we we were okay with them if they think if their program really really works but you're not really going to get people not driving if you're if giving them parking and not equivalent benefits so we did um all of those uh things another sort of argument we made was we said look the employees the employers have control here they um, never have to spend more money than they're spending now so it is it is worth noting that some number of employees who are who are not or offered a benefit aren't taking it today. Uh, and so there are costs if you just leave the benefit just as it is. The, the ones who actually were parking and no longer parking, yes, the employee employer can recoup that, that value through subletting the parking. 
but there are some actual costs. So the spreadsheets that Cheryl was talking about essentially said, well, here's different ways of doing it. Here's, a, here's an option where you can have no cost the employer. So the employee would have to pay a bit for parking that they weren't paying before, but the whole spreadsheet amount would sort of equal out. So the, the, um, the control sort of remained in, in the employer's uh, hands. There's one final um, comment I wanna make related to equity. Um, and that is, it didn't play out quite as smoothly as we thought. It, it seemed a very obvious thing that poorer people um, are um, gonna drive less, have fewer cars in the household. But some of the council members who represent the poor districts, uh, they were sometimes focused on the fact that the parking benefits themselves were going to the higher uh, wage workers. Mm -hmm. And so we had to say, well, even if that's occurring, you still have, uh, you know, the lower, the lower wage folks in within a group getting a benefit are the ones who are most likely to take advantage of it. The one compelling argument at the city level, I thought, was that if you look, and Andrea Hammer had done some really great research that we, we took advantage of. If you look, um, if, if you look at how people are getting to work to begin with, the people coming out from out of the city are much more likely to be driving into the city. And so we said, well, why, why is it that DC employers can favor out of town commuters driving into our city and disadvantage our own residents and the benefits that they offer? And that was an argument. I it thought it, that went pretty well, but, um, Anyway, I, I want to thank, um, I see Dr. Shoup is uh, on the, in the call and um, particularly for being the great inspiration and writing so much about- the father the, of parking cash out. Father of parking cash out. <laughs> to recognize Nazi there, but thanks Cheryl, a great presentation. Thanks Alan, for all your great work. Thank you Alan for sharing your insights too. Sure. We have a couple more questions and then we'll go into the breakout session. So you have any other thoughts, please feel free to ask them there. So for the next question, we have Paul. Um, he's asking, do you see any possibility that experience with this might later lead to extending this to the employer owned parking that is currently exempted? Or maybe publicity about parking cash out by employers with lease parking might put pressure on the universities and others to be more open to this. Yeah, maybe. And I think uh, so um, two things. One is that um, uh, in the compromise to exempt owned parking, which is very painful for us, um, they did something that was smart. It, it actually um, only excludes existing owned parking. So if an employer, um, uh, buys, I mean, they probably will figure out how to do it if, if they have multiple campuses, but basically if you, in the future, if you acquire new owned parking, that, that shouldn't be part of this. So that's at least one thing that would be helpful. Um, you know, I think that DC requires that universities do campus plans <clears throat> and the city planning staff and transportation staff have progressively gotten more out of um, those campus plans from a transportation demand management perspective, um, they're now doing parking caps rather than minimum parking requirements for those campus plans. And that's really, that was one of the things that, like camp, university said it was, we can't do this because we have a minimum. Um, so you're gonna, you're, you're gonna hurt us by saying we have to maintain this parking space on the one hand and on the other hand, we're supposed to cash them out. So getting the, doing the parking cap is, um, is a really important step forward, but they do them campus plan by campus plan. So that's really good. Hospitals do not have campus plans unless they're basically tied to the university. And that I found to be the most frustrating because um, we just need so much more innovation in, in the healthcare hospital space. And they seem to be the most resistant um, to innovation. And they were just the most ridiculous examples of um, basically hospitals charging a lot of money to park um, if you're a visitor and um, ridiculously low or free if you are a worker and then them being and then the parking space is being allocated by seniority. Um, so I feel like the, the hospitals have a really long way to go 
to um, adopting more progressive. Look, I, I, I harped on um, Seattle Children's Hospital TDM plan all the time, but um, you know, I found it really hard to break into sort of the hospital scene and, um, and you know, we sort of have the farthest to go with them. With universities, I am hopeful that we can, we can uh, move them, but they like to split. I will say, I feel like they're cheating. They always like to split out their mode split by saying, oh, our students are mostly riding the shuttle and riding the bikes and walking it. And, and basically to cover up for the subsidies they're providing to their staff um, for, their, for their employees. Okay, very interesting. So we have time for one last question. So Michael, he asks, do you have any thoughts on pursuing a commute trip reduction law that includes cash outs as strategy versus a law exclusively focused on cash outs? I wanna ask Alan about this. We really considered that as we were kind of getting nowhere on our parking cash out legislation. I don't know, um, Parking cash out is like just a really direct intervention of like the root of the problem, basically. Of well, we, just we subsidizing have, driving. Sure, we have that option. If, if it's essentially they, they, the employers can have a TDM plan that is. I mean, right, but it's more like the Seattle model, right? Where basically Seattle businesses are driven to parking cash out and other right. innovative approaches because of the commute reduction legislation. I don't, you know, I don't know that that's any easier than, than winning parking cash out. And I feel right. like parking subsidy is sort of the root of the root of all urban evil, basically. Yeah, yeah, we basically we challenged them to meet it any way they could. Some of them said we're doing so much so that's so incredible. We just, we shouldn't have to do this too. And, and so this was our, I, I mean, I guess if they were doing the cash out, they wouldn't have to do the other. But um, you really can't meet, the goal is really difficult. You really can't meet it by, you know, maybe if you're a big hospital and you give three people free parking, you can meet it and you've got a few hundred employees, but largely there's no way you can get it. It's a 25%, 25% SOV commute cap is the goal. And we say that whatever rate you're at, you're supposed to get 10% uh, closer every year. It's a really, really tough standard to meet. Uh, and if you're not, there's no way <laughs> you're going to meet it if you're continuing to just give parking away and not do uh, offer the equivalent. Okay, thank you, Cheryl, and also Alan for uh, sharing your thoughts on that. So that concludes tonight's events. We also have an optional breakout session if you'd like to hang around. Uh, you could also uh, stick around to chat about parking in general if you want to. Um, so uh, Tony is going to sort um, everyone into breakout rooms if you want to stay around. If you want to chat with Cheryl, please type in a one. If you want to just chat about anything, you can type a two. So we don't see you. Um, we hope you have a good night. Thanks for joining us. And if you're not a member already of the Parking Inform Network, please consider joining and check out our website, parkinginform.org for more about um, how to be a member. Thank you.